Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Welcome to our webinar, um, Optimize Portfolios Using the Markowitz Model, brought to you by the ARC Consortium and Christoph. The ARC Consortium works with and supports key organizations developing the R software through grants and sponsorship worldwide. Please visit our website to learn all the details and how your organization can become a member. My name is Elenia and I will be today's presenter. Um, I, I'm sorry, not presenter, announcer. Um, I just have a few um, housekeeping items before we begin. This webinar will have an interactive Q&A section between you and the presenter. Just type in, in a question um, at the uh, questions window and at any point um, of the presentation. And then near the end of the webinar, we'll try to answer um, as many of your questions as time allows. Okay, let's get started. Um, this webinar focuses again on the optimized portfolios using the Markowitz model. Um, Christoph um, is an independent data science and business intelligence expert. He um, co-created and maintains the Tidy Finance Project, a transparent open source approach to research in financial economics. Um, Christoph, thank you so much. Um, you can go ahead and begin your presentation. Well, thank you, Elena, for the introduction and thank you uh, to the R Consortium for, for having me or us, the Tidy Finance Project. Um, and this webinar series is a great opportunity for us to create new content that is not yet included on uh, our website, but eventually everything that I will uh, talk about in this webinar series might either end up as a blog post or uh, a book chapter. All right, so the topic of today is the famous Markowitz, Markowitz model. So if you are new to uh, financial economics, then this is a great topic to start because it's taught in basically every uh, business and um, financial economics uh, degree. And if you are already an advanced user and you know the Markowitz model, you've applied it yourself, then hopefully my talk will still show you a new way how to uh, approach this, um, the tidy finance way. So let's start first with a bit of historical context and significance of Harry Markowitz. So he pioneered modern uh, portfolio theory, and we'll talk about what we mean by modern portfolio theory in a bit. Um, and he pioneered by writing a very influential paper that he published in 1952. And this paper was a theoretical paper on portfolio selection. And I think I, I checked the numbers a couple of weeks ago and it was cited more than 36,000 times. He also wrote a book about the same topic uh, in the years after the publication of this paper. And eventually in 1990, he uh, received the Sverige Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences, uh, commonly known as the Nobel Prize in uh, Economics, together with Merton Miller and Bill Sharp. So those two names will also uh, reappear again in the next webinar. Um, so in his theoretical paper, he asks the question, how should one optimally allocate wealth across assets, which have different characteristics. In particular, he talks about returns, risks, and correlations of risks between those assets. And a very crucial insight of the paper at the time was it's of course individual asset risk is very important if you want to optimize portfolios but you also have to consider the correlations between those risks and what Markowitz did in the paper is that he formalized the trade-off between uh, expected returns that you might get by, by investing in uh, certain assets and the risks that those assets carry and he developed the mean variance analysis uh, framework, which uh, became a key tool in financial economics after the publication of the paper. And we will revisit these topics during our talk. We will look at the mean variance uh, analysis and we will look at this trade-off. 
So it's not just portfolio management, but also risk management has benefited uh, greatly from uh, Markowitz's um, contribution. So I talk, I mentioned we want to maximize expected returns. So before we dive into uh, looking at the data and some R code, let's, let's uh, get a better understanding of what we mean by expected returns. So loosely speaking, it's, I mean, it's the profit that you anticipate from investment in the future. And I will introduce uh, some notation as we go through this uh, webinar. And typically, one uses a uh, Greek letter mu to represent the expected return of an asset. And we will use the subscript i to uh, refer to a specific asset. So when you hear an expected return, what you can think of, uh, interpret it uh, intuitively as, a, for instance, 10% return uh, for Apple stock over the next 12 months. Sounds very reasonable that investors want to maximize those returns that they get in the future, but at the same time, typically want to minimize risks. And risk is a very complicated topic in financial economics. Um, so what I will talk about and what Markowitz did is we will focus on the volatility uh, as a measure for risk. I will get back to that towards the end of my uh, webinar. So whenever I talk about risk today, think about the returns are typically volatile. So if you have stock returns in mind and more volatility means more risk. Notation wise, we will use the Greek letter Sigma to represent the volatility of the asset. And intuitively speaking, you can, as an example, let's pick Apple again. If you think uh, when we talk about volatility, you might say that, okay, Apple stock might move up or down 15% over the next uh, 12 months. And really the main point or like well, the crucial point of Harry Markowitz was that we should really look at the correlations of uh, risks in assets, not just the individual asset risk. Because the concept that he formalized is diversification. It can really help investors uh, in reducing risk. So I really like the fruit basket analogy. We can refer back to Apple. So if all you have are apples in your fruit basket and those apples spoil, you will lose everything. All your apples are bad. The whole fruit basket is, is bad. But if you have a variety of fruits, some fruits may spoil, but others will stay fresh. So uh, you can still uh, enjoy some of your fruits uh, later on. So if you um, use that analogy uh, for investments, it means that you should spread your investments across assets, uh, across different assets, and which cause this will help you to reduce the overall risk of your portfolio. It doesn't mean to just spread your investment across stocks, but you should even spread it across different uh, asset classes like bonds, real estate, commodities, uh, or crypto if you want to. So what we will do now in the webinar is that we look, uh, look at some R code that uh, estimates those expected returns for an example portfolio. Then we will talk about estimating this variance covariance matrix um, and because these are the individual uh, risk measures that we want to uh, compute. And then we turn to calculating portfolio returns and volatility. And then we will talk about this optimization stuff that uh, Markowitz has uh, done. So um, some more notation. So typically expected returns are calculated based on sample average returns. I will show you some code in a minute. But what we basically do is we create the, the average return over uh, a number of periods. So here we use the mu again to denote 
the the return of the asset i, but we use the the, the head to denote uh, that this to to um, to highlight that this is an estimated quantity. And here, r i now is the return of asset i in period t, and the big T refers to the total number of periods. Again, as an example, let's suppose we have uh, historical returns for Apple over the last couple of years. Or so we have 8%, 10%, 6, 12, and 9. So now our estimate for the 12 month expected return of Apple would be the average across those uh, years, which amounts to 9%. So what we're assuming by doing this is that the past performance indicates the future performance. So this obviously is a strong assumption. Um, there are different ways to create uh, estimated uh, returns, but this is like the textbook case. So we will go with this. Now, let's start with the R code. We want to download daily stock prices in order to calculate returns. So the packages that I'm using uh, for most of this webinar is the tidyverse and the tidy finance package that we developed because we can use the tidy finance package to uh, easily download um, data from multiple sources for instance what we do as a first step is that we want to download stock symbols symbols are identifiers of stocks um, we will take a look at them uh, in a minute and what we use throughout this webinar is the Dow Jones Industrial Average Index as our portfolio of stocks. So there are 30 stocks in that index and we just try to optimize the portfolio with those 30 stocks. Now that we have these symbols, we can also use the tidy finance package to download stock prices. And I just take the last five years of data you can uh, later extend the time series and play around uh, with the results so but what we get uh, in the end is this uh, data frame where in the first column we have a symbol so u and h is a symbol for a stock it's an abbreviation um, we have uh, dates so we have the daily dates um, and we have individual prices for the stocks. So now we have stock prices, but we need returns. So it's very easy to calculate them um, because we have a lot of different stocks in there, a lot of different stock symbols. We group by the symbol and calculate the return just as the so-called raw returns. So how much did the price change relative to the price in the preceding period? So what we now have, it looks very similar to the data frame uh, before, we have a symbol, a date column, but now we have a return column. We don't need the price uh, anymore, so we just omitted that. Now, as I said before, the expected returns uh, are typically um, calculated based on average returns for each stock. So this is exactly what we're doing here. So we take our returns daily that we just calculated, we group by symbol again and calculate uh, the mu for each symbol by uh, just using the mean across these returns. Uh, and I also um, want to illustrate these average returns by using ggplot and we put on the x-axis the average return and then the y, we order the symbols by the stock returns. And I use a, a column geom. Uh, so what we see here are the average daily returns of Dow index constituents. We see that on the x-axis, um, the numbers are very small. Then again, these are daily returns. So stocks typically don't move that much uh, over uh, days. And you can see that the average daily return was highest for a stock with the symbol AAPL, so that's Apple, and MSFT would be Microsoft. 
And you can also see that there's only one stock, which over these five years that I uh, downloaded has an average negative return. And that's uh, DIS, which refers to Disney. Now we have these average returns and we want to use this information later to create an optimal uh, portfolio. But before we do that, we move on to um, calculating our measure of risk. So volatility measures the individual asset risk. This formula is just the standard deviation of returns, basically. And um, we so you look at the differences between the individual returns and the average return, and you create the squared sum. Uh, I can call it the average and take the square root of that. The interpretation for this standard deviation of the volatility is quite simple because it means a higher volatility indicates higher risk in the asset because the returns will move more uh, in the future. Again, the assumption here is that the past is indicative of the future. So if you want to estimate volatilities, we again take the returns daily as an input. We group by symbol and you can calculate the sigma of volatility for each stock by just using the built-in SD function. So if we want to look at that again, we can just join it to the data frame that we have uh, calculated before that contains the, the mu's for each symbol. And then we again, create uh, a column, uh, a geom call by putting the volatilities in the x-axis and the uh, symbols on the y-axis. So here we see the daily volatilities of the Dow Industrial Average Index constituents. Um, and you see that Apple World had the highest um, average return, but actually, it's somewhere in the middle together with Microsoft when we look at the volatility. And it's actually another stock, uh, BA, which I don't know by heart now um, which it is, um, that is the most volatile. Now, remember, we said, okay, individual asset risk is important, but we want to look at the correlations between uh, different asset risks. And we use the covariance to measure this uh, interaction between the assets. So it has a similar formula to the uh, variance or standard deviation that we have looked at before, but it just takes two different stocks and looks how they uh, vary over time together. Don't worry too much about the uh, mathematical details. From an intuitive perspective, it means that a positive Covariance indicates that assets or returns of assets move in the same direction, which could potentially increase portfolio risk. So if it, this is very high, this, this covariance. Or if the covariance is negative, it means that uh, assets move into the opposite direction. So this could really be beneficial. So if you combine two assets, because if one goes up, the other one goes down. So this is exactly what can happen, uh, can yield benefits through the process of diversification. Now a bit more code. Um, what we do to calculate this covariance uh, matrix, the simplest approach is to use a built-in R function again. So before we had, remember we had the returns with uh, uh, in the long format. So uh, symbols, rows and column uh, dates and the, um, the returns. And what we're doing now is we create this, uh, transform it to a wide format. So because the covariance, uh, as you will see in a minute, variance covariance matrix is that the name contains it's a matrix. So it's an input, we also use uh, this uh, wide format. Because then we can just simply use the cof function, which is, uh, as I said before, in part of the, uh, the R installation. And we have all those variances and covariances. So there is some more 
if we want to plot this with ggplot, then we have to do some more transformations, but I will just show you the figure um, because this is what we get in the end. Uh, uh, the tiles uh, indicate the magnitude of the variance or covariance, and you have the stocks on the x and the y axis. So for instance, so on the diagonal, for instance, you have the individual variances. Uh, and as we can see, as we saw before, that the BA is the is the most intense red color because this is the highest uh, volatility of all stocks. And you can see the blue areas. These are combinations of stocks that have very low uh, covariance, so they don't move much together. Um, and some stocks move together uh, a lot. Now we have everything to move on to the portfolios. So the expected portfolio return is calculated by um, created a, creating a weighted sum of these individual asset returns. So now what's new in the notation is that we have this omega i, which is the weight of asset i in the portfolio. Um, and from before, we have these new heads, I, which are the estimated expected returns of an asset. Again, to illustrate this with an example, so if asset A and 60% weight with an expected return of 8%, and asset B with a 40% weight and an expected return of 12%, if you want to uh, create the expected return of your portfolio, then you have to multiply um, the weights with the expected returns and take the sum. So this example, the expected return of the portfolio would be 9.6%. What we're assuming here for simplicity is that these portfolio weights are constant over time. There's a whole body of research that uh, looks at uh, how these weights can change dynamically uh, over time and how this relates to uh, risk and returns. For the portfolio variance, we're doing a similar thing. Um, but now we need, uh, because we have this big variance covariance matrix that gives us uh, covariances between all the individual stocks. We uh, have to now use the weights in these different assets and combine them to create a weighted sum of this uh, portfolio variance. So omega and omega j, these are the weights of assets i and j, there's two different assets in the portfolio. The sigma hat is the covariance between the asset I and asset J that we've just illustrated uh, with this tile plot and N refers to the number of assets in the portfolio. Now we have everything actually to talk about portfolio optimization. So we have an estimate for the individual asset returns. We have an estimate for the variances of individual, the, the volatilities of individual stocks and the covariances between stocks. And we have formulas how to aggregate them for our portfolio. And the minimum variance framework. Now, this is what Markowitz also introduced, is that we want to minimize this portfolio variance. This is just the expression that I've shown you before, while staying fully invested. So this means we want to find weights. So for each individual asset, this is why we're minimizing from omega one to omega n. We want to find those optimal weights such that all the money that we have is put into one or multiple, like uh, into some of those assets. Can of course relax these constraints, but we'll I'll get back to that later. It makes things 
easier actually to uh, rewrite this problem in matrix notation. So if you're not familiar uh, with this uh, type of uh, notation, um, I can refer also to our book to uh, take more time to digest what's what, what's going on. But this is just exactly the same problem that uh, I've described before. So we now have uh, this omega describes all the individual asset weights. The big sigma with the head describes the variance covariance matrix that we've estimated. Um, and the constraint at the bottom uh, is actually just the sum over all the weights that we have uh, looked at. With the matrix notation, it's fairly easy to derive um, a solution to the problem. So uh, in financial economics, you set up an optimization problem with a Lagrangian and then you do first derivatives and stuff like that. And you can derive the optimal weight for this minimum variance portfolio. Um, and again, for details, please uh, go to uh, tidyfinance.org and check out our introductory chapter where I've taken this from. Um, what we need here to calculate this optimal weight uh, is the sigma to the power of minus one, which is the inverse of the variance covariance matrix. And this is um, the R code below implements exactly this solution um, that, that you see uh, on the top. It's also with the vector and uh, matrix notation. Now let's move to the more interesting part, uh, interpreting um, the results. So what we uh, are plotting here is um, these optimal portfolio weights. So how much do you put into each individual asset of the DAO uh, index um, if you want to minimize the variance? And this figure shows you these weights. So on the top, you see um, that more than 20% more than uh, should be put into the, uh, I think VZ, VZ refers to Verizon, and about 20% to Walmart. Um, so these get a very high weight in this mid to, if you want to minimize the variance of the portfolio. And on the other end of the Y axis, you can see that there are some stocks with negative weights. So this means that the minimum variance portfolio such a, uh, proposes that you should short those stocks. So if you, uh, uh, it means basically you're borrowing the stock and you're betting that the price will uh, decrease over time. And this is also something that probably for uh, retail investors is a bit harder to do. So there's also an extension to this Markowitz uh, problem where you um, uh, do not allow for these short sale constraints, but I will get back to that later. So now we have our optimal portfolio rates to for the minimum variance portfolio. And what we can do now is we can calculate the portfolio return and the portfolio volatility for this minimum variance portfolio. And um, this is the code that calculates this solution. So you get a mu and a sigma for this portfolio using exactly this uh, aggregation equations that I've shown you before. So sum uh, for the mu, we sum, we take the, the weighted sum of these individual asset uh, expected returns. And for the sigma, we again use um, this matrix notation that I've used in the uh, calculation of the optimal minimum variance problem. Now we have calculated a specific portfolio that minimizes the variance and for fully staying invested. What we typically want is to achieve some minimum expected return while still minimize uh, uh, the portfolio variance. 
And these are typically called efficient portfolios. So this is what we will do next. The optimization problem is exactly the same. So the top, you want to minimize the uh, variance. And in the bottom, you see that in addition to the uh, constraint to stay fully invested, so the omega, that the sum of all omegas should be one. We also want to have uh, that the, the weighted sum of those expected returns is at least uh, or is equal to uh, minimum expected return mu bar. So this sounds a bit weird. What what can this mu bar uh, be? It is a subjective choice, but what I think makes sense is to look at maybe another index that I want to beat. So what I show you here is the on the red line, you see the Dow Jones uh, industrial average over these five years that, that we are looking at here in the webinar. And we are comparing it to the NASDAQ 100 index. As most of you probably know, the NASDAQ 100 has uh, performed quite astonishingly because of the AI boom. So I now want to optimize my portfolio that consists of these Dow, uh, 30 stocks from the Dow Industrial Average to achieve at least the average return that I would have achieved with the NASDAQ 100 index. So again, we use the tiny finance package to uh, download the data. I'm not spending too much time here. So we take this, we download the index, create, uh, calculate the returns, and just uh, create, uh, calculate the average return. I just want to note that this minimum uh, expected return needs to be higher than uh, the uh, return that you would get from, or at least as high as the return would get from the minimum variance portfolio. And there's also an analytical solution for this. Uh, I'm definitely not going into details here for this efficient portfolio. Um, again, I'll refer to tidyfinance.org if you are interested in this. Um, you can derive this analytically and you have to use a, a couple of uh, uh, notation helpers to, to make this somewhat readable. And you can implement this solution again. I'm sorry, it looks a bit ugly that um, this is this is, uh, but this is unfortunately how the analytical solution looks like. But you can just uh, calculate the uh, efficient portfolio omega and use this as an input to calculate the efficient portfolio returns as well, just as we did with the minimum variance portfolio returns. Now that's that's now we it gets really interesting because what we want to see is the risk return trade off between different portfolios and stocks. So what you see on the x axis is the volatility of individual stocks or portfolios, and on the y axis you see the average return, or as we called it before, the expected return of uh, the assets. And the individual dots refer to the individual assets that we have in our portfolio. So the stocks from the Dow uh, industrial average. And the red dots refer to these portfolios that we have just calculated. So the minimum variance portfolio that's on the left. Um, and it obviously has a lower return than the efficient portfolio because this is, I mean, this is what we imposed. We wanted to have a, uh, a portfolio that has at least the NASDAQ 100 portfolio returns. And you see that this actually has a very similar, similar variance to the minimum variance portfolio. But don't forget that both the minimum variance and the efficient portfolio just consists of combinations of stocks from the Dow industrial average. So there's, I did not download any uh, additional stocks from the NASDAQ 100. And a crucial concept that enters now this comparison of different portfolios versus the assets 
um, is the so-called efficient frontier. So here I uh, added a link to the mutual fund separation theorem. It's a very important result in financial economics, which essentially states that any linear combination of efficient portfolios is also efficient. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, I highly encourage you to uh, read the Wikipedia article and maybe some references uh, that are in there. Or just Google mutual fund separation theorem. There's a lot of stuff out there. But what we get from this result is that we can derive the highest achievable expected return for each level of risk um, in our setting. And this is the so-called efficient frontier. Here, I, I give you the code for the efficient frontier. This is a linear combination. So R, the, the, we use the letter A, uh, some range between minus one and four. Uh, with a step size by 0 0.01. On what we're doing now is, uh, and using the tidyverse and the per map function, just to create a linear combination of the efficient portfolio weight and the minimum variance portfolio weight. And then we, oops, sorry, then we in the, in the other lines, which just calculate mu and sigma as we did before. Now let's visualize the efficient frontier by adding it to the figure that I've just shown you. So now you can see that obvious, I mean, obviously the minimum variance and the efficient portfolio are on this uh, efficient frontier. And by combining those two portfolios, you can achieve any point on this uh, black line. So this means that you cannot create a portfolio that outperforms or has, has a better trade-off. So you cannot be above this line uh, by combining the assets that you see as black dots below. And this is a very important result in uh, financial economics. Now, I've shown you how to um, create uh, calculate the minimum variance portfolio and efficient portfolio using analytical solutions. Um, but typically in practice, there are all kinds of other problems. So you cannot really calculate analytical solutions. So you have to do some numerical stuff. And here I want to show you um, uh, the amazing portfolio analytics package uh, and how you could use this package first to replicate the stuff that I've just shown you. And I also want to mention a couple of other things that you can do with it. So I used the portfolio analytics package and the CVXR package. CVXR um, is a modern optimizer and it's very flexible um, that they also just recently introduced to the portfolio analytics package. And what we need as an input now is a returns matrix. Uh, but we have to transform the returns that we had uh, before a bit by uh, moving the dates out of this uh, matrix. And the cool thing with portfolio analytics is that you can iteratively build a model. So for instance, um, as a portfolio specification, we put in um, the returns matrix, so these 30 assets that we have just uh, worked with all the time. In line nine, you can see that you can simply add an objective. So what we want to uh, minimize, so we want to minimize the type risk, and we will use the variance for this. And as a constraint, we will use add this full investment constraint. So this is just as we've talked about before. Um, so the sum over all weights should be equal to one. And then you can just call the optimize portfolio function, um, which takes this returns matrix, the problem that we have specified. And here I also 
specify the optimization method to BCVXR. And then we can compare the solution that we got to the solution that we uh, already derived before. So the omega MVP is the stuff that we have derived before. And the all equal check returns true. So that's good. Our analytic resolution returns exactly the same as uh, what the package does. If we want to replicate the efficient portfolio, it's very similar. Um, I mean, the objective this is the same, right? All that we did is just added another constraint to the full investment constraint. And we can do this by specifying the type return constraint and adding a return target, which is exactly the mu bar, the average NASDAQ 100 return that we have derived before. And so we call again the optimized portfolio function uh, with this new updated problem. Um, so the same syntax as before. And again, so the all equal check returns true. So what we have received as a, as a solution is the same as uh, what we've derived analytically, the omega EFP. I think the portfolio analytics package comes with huge benefit, namely that they have a lot of extensions available. So I've mentioned before that practice, it might be hard to really short stocks. So you could just add the constraint long only. You can say, okay, even though my there are 30 assets out there, I only want to invest uh, the maximum of um, uh, 10. So you can have a position limit constraint. And alternatively, if you don't think that uh, the volatility is the right measure for the risk of an asset, you could uh, just change the objective by using a different name. For instance, the expected shortfall as uh, a target to, to, to minimize. And there are many more. So I'm not an author of the portfolio analytics uh, package. I'm just a user, but I think that the official vignette provides a lot of details on what you can do uh, with this package. And since you uh, can easily combine different things, it's 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 very composable. And this is something I really like about it. So you can hype the different uh, adding constraints and the, the objectives. And it's also flexible with respect to optimizers. So if you have restrictions on that front, you can also uh, use a different optimizer. Okay. So with this, Last piece of information, I arrive at my concluding slide. So the key takeaways now are that this mean variance framework that we have looked at, that we've implemented in R, the analytical solutions ourselves, and use portfolio analytics to, to uh, confirm the results. This framework is really a cornerstone in financial economics. The tidy finance package provides a very simple a way to download this financial data. From our perspective, it's easy to compute this analytical solutions. Um, but if you want to go further, the portfolio analytics package is a great way to implement extensions. And if you really want to dig into more advanced stuff, uh, for instance, uh, constraint optimization backtesting, we have a whole chapter on that on tidyfinance.org. So I encourage you to check that out. And last but not least, um, if you want to stay uh, in touch um, or follow me uh, for news, um, I'm happy to connect on LinkedIn. And um, the slides are also uh, available on talks.tidefinance.org, but I think we will also make them accessible over the R consortium. So thank you everybody for uh, participating and Let's see whether there were some questions. Um, okay. 
Ah, the question was answered. <laughs> Teal asked whether it's possible to get a link to the presentation. But yeah. Okay, we have a question. Where is the price data sourced from? So um, at the tidy finance package, we do the same as the tidy quant package. We use the unofficial API from Yahoo Finance. So actually it's a bit of a, uh, so when you go to Yahoo Finance and it loads the chart, um, you can actually check get the API call and use that to, to download the prices. Another question, um, have you tried doing black litamon portfolio optimizations in this manner? Unfortunately, not yet, but from this, so I've heard black litamon, the question about black litamon, um, now the second time, so I guess once we write up the chapter, we will make sure to, to, to mention uh, black litamon. Finally, yeah, it's definitely a gap. Okay, so at the moment there are no more open questions. Um... Um, I guess we can go ahead and end the webinar here since there are no more questions. Okay. All right. So then, yeah, thank you everybody for uh, participating. In the upcoming webinar, we will talk about the capital asset, process, capital asset pricing model and uh, some of its extensions. And afterwards, we will talk more about uh, using financial ratios to evaluate firms and um using the discounted cash flow model to uh, create company valuations yeah really much looking forward to it <laughs>